Uh, so having said that, I think it's, it's it's the way we look at it. It's the way we train ourselves to get better and um, have that control. And it may be actually leading to even more opportunities than they were before, right? Because because with the use of AI, you are able to save so much time that you can use your brain in planning more and using the AI to maybe execute certain things in an ethical and controlled manner. Uh, so I think that's how we, we should try and look at it, um, is my opinion, honestly. Uh, but yes, having said that, it, it it also shows that, you know, it's like survival of the fittest. If you don't, if you don't go um, with the times, then you will stay back, whether you're a person or a brand or a large company. I have about uh, between 10 and 11 years of experience uh, ballpark. Um, so, and I kind of uh, have spent a vast majority of my time and almost nine plus years uh, in the PR and comms field. Um, and just to give you a quick introduction, my name is Vignesh Shankar. Uh, I'm currently the product innovation manager at uh, Good Day at Britannia Industries Limited. Um, I've been in transition on this role uh, from October of last year. And uh, I joined Britannia in June 2021 as Britannia's first ever dedicated PR manager. So I was grateful for that opportunity. And before that, I used to work with Mercedes-Benz India um, in the Copcom field again. So I was the launch and lifestyle communications uh, manager there. Um, so again, a car freak. So I worked there for about five years and it was a fantastic learning, great brand. Um, prior to that, I was doing my master's. Um, I did my master's in advertising and marketing from the University of Leeds, United Kingdom. Um, and prior to that, I have some agency experience as well. Uh, so I've worked for two uh, leading agencies in the IPG group as well as WPP group. So I kind of started my career uh, with Genesis, it was then known as Genesis Person Masteller, uh, GBM, which is now I think Genesis BCW. Uh, ironically, they are our agency today at Britannia, uh, they are our PR agency. Uh, but yes, I started my career, a PR career there and I'm again very um, thankful for the great experience that I had there at the very start of my career because I was like, 21, 22 when I started my career and in the city of Mumbai and as you know Mumbai is the hustler's pad um, so it was a great time to kind of get into the professional scheme of things um, I had the opportunity to go there and that was awesome and I worked there for about two and a half years and um, worked across multiple clients but I would say a major part of my journey consisted of um, getting in touch and you know getting adept with the entertainment industry um, the reason is one of our clients was Colors, one of our biggest clients, uh, Colors from the Ycom Group 18 um, and I used to handle all reality shows, uh, PR. So for example, you may have definitely heard of Big Boss. I think uh, somewhere that was, if I may say, my claim to fame because uh, as a young a youngster, I was quite enthused about, you know, how this entire reality show game works. And um, I worked there two seasons back to back for season five and six, uh, where I was actually present on the set, you know. Um, and as you can imagine, there's a lot that goes on. Uh, as a viewer, what you may see in a one hour episode, but that's actually a culmination of 24 hours of content. So there's a lot of back and work and a daily basis that happens for three months. Uh, in the process, uh, from a PR standpoint, uh, my responsibility was to cut out exclusive stories, common stories, and many other things in terms of evictions and so on and so forth. And as you can understand, a show like that had demand in terms of stories coming in from every part of the country. And if I look back at it today, uh, I think that learning kind of really improved my media intelligence to understand what media works in which part of the country, right? And what kind of content also get people excited in those regions. So in this ball game, you understand a lot on the consumer side as well as on the media side. Um, so for me, uh, I think that was a great learning in that space. Uh, and at the same time, when you're on the set, you are trying to kind of get information from different stakeholders because there's a channel, there's a production house, and of course there's my own PR agency because I have pressures coming from all over and then eventually we have to deliver good content to the media, right? Uh, who are your key stakeholders overall. And I think in this ball game, um, I made a lot of good relations and I'm proud to say that some of them are still my friends and uh, good friends and acquaintances. And um, that for me was a good spark in my PR career before I went for my masters. And uh, yes, I did work for many other clients like Dolby Digital Surround and Pepsi Change the Game campaign, which was an award-winning one at the time. Um, so I think that exposure for about two and a half years or so was brilliant, especially because, you know, this applied work um, kind of helps when you're learning academia in a university, whether you're doing your master's or your MBA and so on. You obviously tend to relate to what you've done at work, you know, or on the field or wherever that you may have. And you get to learn that or apply that in a better manner, at least in your head or in certain projects and so on. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about me in terms of my previous background and uh, yes, I can go on in terms of my Mercedes life as well. Uh, but yes, I'd just like to quickly jump on to Britannia, which I think is the most relevant and the most recent uh, from June onwards. 
you know, um, again, if you it, just on a lighter note, I think we all got exposed to data in computer classes when we were in school. You know, it's like data is very raw. Information is what you put data together and stare out, right? I just want to share that insight and see how kind of that brings together. And I would say I'd like to maybe part that in two ways. Uh, one is that how we use data in the agency side of things and how we use data on the corporate side of things, right? While there's not too much of a difference, but I'm just telling you from my own experience how it was. Um, to begin with, um, when, for example, I told you I joined Jensen BCW, um, I was very new, I was very young, and then they just dumped a huge amount of data on me in forms of Excel sheets. The first data that I got was a list of more than 200 media professionals across the country. And I was told to clean up the list. Um, you know, as a youngster, I was like, I was wondering, okay, this is a lot of data, and this is almost a very mundane job. Am I really like wanting to do this? And what will I get out of this? You know, I mean, as a kid, you don't maybe understand things as I do today. And trust me, believe me, you, uh, sort of today I see the value of doing all of that and how it helps me in my daily life today, right? Uh, so yes, we started with a lot of data like that, cleaning up Excel sheets, calling up people, and then filtering out who's the most relevant, who's the most prominent, and so on and so forth. That's the very base level of it, right? Then you get into work for different clients. And what do they want? They want the most accurate, meaningful, easy to consume media reports, for instance. And what do you do there? You get a bunch of data from them. In, again, in terms of Excel sheets, of PowerPoints, and all the things that have happened, say, for a particular campaign or a brand project or so on. You get all of that, and then you have to apply your mind to it, filter out what you think is not relevant, keep the things which you think is relevant, and then go on uh, to kind of take out an analysis from there. And for me, that data analysis at such a young age, again, taught me a lot, right? It, it broadens your horizon in terms of how you're thinking, what is the need of the business? Why will this kind of talk point in? At the end of the day, you have to put yourself, what would the leader want in that particular company or brand, right? Why would he or she want to see this data? Or what form would they want to see this data in? And you have to filter out that data and present it in a form that is valuable information for them to make business decisions on. I think once you get that clarity in your head, you'll be able to process the data much faster, much better, and the brief gets clearer, right? Uh, so that's from the agency side of things, right? Now, when you step into the brand side of things, now let's say if you take uh, Mercedes as a as an example, um, there's a ton of data. It's a very niche clientele that you have, right? And a niche clientele across the country, and they know what they want. They're very shrewd. They're very uh, well traveled. They're very well exposed. So that makes it all the more interesting and challenging at the same time because you're using a bunch of data to talk to people who are very well informed. And then again, using that data to communicate to your bosses or your clients or whoever that may be um, in terms of, you know, the end user. And you have to think, how can I use this data to make sense out of it and maybe design a campaign around it? So, for example, if I have a data of 100 people and I know that I have to launch a particular car or a particular product or a service, I need to be clear about the fit because there's always a gap between what you want to offer and what the consumer wants. And I think using this data and information, you can create a campaign narrative. And that's why we say that you know, there's a lot of data there, but then there's, that's when the gut also comes in. You use the data smartly, use your gut, and then you come to the decision. And I think that is something that over time you keep learning, you keep processing, you keep getting better at it. And um, yes, and today, like we have, now if I look at Britannia, you can imagine from an FMCG standpoint, we have data uh, from every nook and corner of the country. Now, what brands they deliver to different regions, smaller pockets, bigger pockets, large brands like Good Day, which like almost everyone in India eats or Marigold. Uh, but at the same time, there are always key markets. What are the insights do we get from there? And uh, it's amazing because each time you analyze some data, you get better at the next time you analyze it. Because you obviously have certain impressions in your head. You already have some nuances about the regions and the consumption patterns and so on. So it helps you kind of take out that gut feeling a little faster over time. And in FNCG, that's very, very interesting. Like I told you, because we do multiple hyper-regional programs, we do national level uh, campaigns and so on and so forth. Um, and then of course we have the whole sales data, which helps us understand where we are, how much we're growing, how much is the room for us to grow? How can we understand competition? And how can we learn from them and also get better, hopefully, right? Because at the end of the day, it's our investors uh, that we need to pertain to and our overall stakeholders, which is of course consumers being the first. Uh, so I think it's a great space to be in uh, with time. You learn more. And today, of course, you have lots of tools to help you with that as well. It's a very passionate one, close to my heart. Um, in fact, this is one of the first um, brand campaigns that I had done in uh, Britannia, you know, along with the team. Um, this is called uh, Bring Back Milk Bitties Classic. 
Okay, uh, so this was in second half of uh, 21, 2021, uh, just post pandemic, you know, things were recovering slowly and so on. So the business objective was to relaunch Milk Bikis Classic. Now, as I told you, Milk Bikis as a brand is huge in Tamil Nadu. It's a huge, huge market for us. And it's very important for us to keep on growing there. Just because we're number one, that doesn't mean we, you know, just sit on our laurels, right? So the, the insight here was we had Milk Bikis in the new form, which we call uh, milk rookies, um, we have, um, what do you say, the creme biscuit, we have the waffle biscuit, so to speak, which people relate to. Uh, there's one biscuit which, again, came as a culmination between the R&D team and the marketing team, which was existing in the past, known as Milk Bikis Classic. Now, Milk Bikis goes back to more than 40 years by itself as a brand. And uh, Milk Bikis Classic was a particular biscuit, which had a very peculiar design. Uh, it had a floral shaped border around and in the center of Britannia was written, right? Now many people, um, including my age groups of people elder to me, um, they all relate, there's a huge nostalgic element to it. Now this product went off the market since sometimes in the 90s um, and then you know the new product came through. Uh, now the brief was very clear, we wanted to relaunch Melbiki's Classic and we wanted to use UGC as much as possible and of course we had um, you know, the power of digital to help us sail through that journey. So the campaign that we designed, uh, Sonal Brain Mickey's Classic, was quite simple. We told Tamil Nadu, you give us 1 million votes and we'll bring you your favorite backpack. And we call it the flash backpack. And, you know, there are multiple ways of using the nostalgia aspect to it. And because people had such great and fond memories for this particular product, what we said was, we put out a huge ad in the paper. We, you know, did a lot of PR around it, saying that, help us with your votes and we give you the product back you know that's why it was called bring back milk bikis classic and hashtag my milk bikis memories now the CD was quite simple what you have to do is share one memory in terms of either a photograph or a hashtag or a tweet or any of the social media platforms that you can think of we would consider even a simple hashtag or a comment also as a vote and you know what the task was we wanted one million votes in one week one million right that's 10 lakh and um, we got that in less than five days. Now, this is this is beyond ridiculous because we didn't anticipate, honestly, that it'll go so well, right? And um, I can share nuances where people have shared their images as children when they were in the 80s with their grandparents in with a black and white photograph, imagine, saying, holding the same old pack, the same old biscuit. And there is a very cool, nostalgic element to the way you would consume the biscuit. You would eat the floral background first and then eat each part of the Britannia lettering in the center. So people have shared different ways of which how they used to do it. There were three, four generations who shared it. And because we had digital uh, to support us in social media, till date, as we speak, we are still getting requests or rather suggestions on how these guys, you know, um, love the product and so on and so forth. And uh, today between me and I don't want to quote the numbers, but we have more than 100 crore brand already. And we started off as a much, you know, lower brand. It was nothing, it was not existential. And if you see the brand track, it goes like double, triple, quadruple. And I think it's very rare uh, to find a product to do so well, right? I mean, it doesn't pockets and spaces, but we're in 2024. Touchwood is doing brilliantly well and growing year on year in handsome double digits. So I think here, um, what it taught us, we had a huge amount of data that came in. We had a huge amount of digital and social media partners. We actually did a tie up with the Hindu group as well and we won awards from every part of the world. So Hindu won Publishers Award in IMA, INMA, which is International News Media Association or something like that, which is a renowned uh, platform and uh, Van Infra, FEs, you name it. Like everywhere we won multiple awards for this and it's very close to my heart campaign I would say because um, you know like I said the brand love is so so strong um, that we see it now in sales and it's very rare that you see that you do a campaign and then suddenly it kind of catapults your sales into like 3x or 4x or whatever x you know uh, so yes that that is one particular campaign that is very close to our hearts I think one other recent program and I'll, I'll leave you with that and I don't take up too much of your time and that is something because you talk about relevance and use of technology right especially in terms of AI and AR being the being the new things um, in the space well to take a step back, firstly, I think, see, AI has been existing in the supply chain world from the time Industry 4.0 was there. Like, for example, if I talk about my previous firm, we've been using AI for a long time in terms of uh, getting, you know, production efficiencies and supply chain efficiencies and so on and so forth. And there are multiple companies that help you with that automation and the back end of it, right? It's just that today, you and I and many others are talking about AI because it's become so consumer friendly and easy for us to use. 
and accessible, right? So that's the first part. But having said that, it has multiple capabilities. It has its own opportunities and obviously some threats as well. So we have to be very smart about how we use this technology and be in control of it, right? That's one. So this Independence Day, we launched it called the 1947% More Independence Campaign. Well, the idea was not many companies uh, are more than 100 years old who have been in India, right? And uh, Britannia as a brand, we were we are a proud centurion company, right? And we've seen the pre-independence era, the world war era, the post-independence era, and so on and so forth. And suddenly, if you notice, mostly during Independence Day, it's usually these multiple bombardment of retail offers and so on and so forth, right? Every time, like buy this, get this free, and you know, it's like a, a sales extravaganza. We as a responsible brand, we chose to kind of come up with a non-commercial campaign. We said we want to use technology and there are very few uh, um, last living fighters in the country today. The freedom fighters I'm talking about who helped us, you and me enjoy this freedom that we are as Indians today for the last you know 75 plus years. It's thanks to their struggles uh, that we are living this great life today. And you know how our economy is booming today. The whole world is looking at India. So we said it's our we have the pride, we have the knowledge, and we have the love for this country. So we want to come up with a campaign that resonates with the latest audiences. Now, let's say so the youngsters of today, they have taken independence, maybe not for granted, but at very ease, you know, as in they've not maybe been taught so much as maybe we were back in history and so on and so forth, right? And and obviously that, that's a good thing because going forward, we'd be always known as a powerful independent country, which is awesome. But we felt take a step back, pay a tribute to these last freedom fighters by using technology. And how we did it was quite simple. Now we chose five packs, uh, like Marigold, Good Day, Wicked Cow, you know, Milk Dickies and one more. Now it was very simple because this kind of real estate, as I may call it, is there in almost every other household, right? Because we penetrate to more than 55% of India's population. Now in that sense, we were like, we have to make it easy for the consumer to also interact with. So we used AI and AR in a very smart way. And this is something that we understand is the youngsters really enjoy. So what we did was we took these five people and I'll share all the details with you going forward of the Freedom Fighters and imagine they must be like 90, 95 plus years of age, right? And what we did was uh, we took their stories from their own voices. We went and interviewed them, obviously with some partners, and um, we interviewed them and asked them about their struggles. And each one of them is sharing their story in their own voice. What we did was we used AI to imagine my name is Srimati Leela Dai, right? One of the ladies. Now she is 95, we used AI to generate an image and a video of how she would have been back during the Andolan times. So you can actually picture her face, uh, if I may say as a much younger version of her, let's say in her early 20s or whatever age that she was in then, and the AI generated that image based on the image of her today, right? And we created a video out of that on how she would talk about her story and her struggles. Similarly, she, Gohari Das, is another freedom fighter. The same thing, we use AI to generate their past. So it's like, on one front, I told you about Milpiki's classic, we're going to the past again and bring it, you know, for the present. And in this case, we are using the past with future technology for the future of the country, for them to learn and kind of respect what these guys have done for us. So the AI was uh, generating the images and the videos. The AR, to answer your question, was used very smartly on the packs. So all you need to do was take your phone, scan the pack, the logo, once you scan the logo, so each product had one, one, so five products, five independent fighters, right? Uh, independence fighters. So each one of them, when you scan the pack through an AR feature, you hear their story and you see it, immersive experience on your phone, on top of the pack. Okay, so this is how we married the AI and AR together. And the response was brilliant, I must say. And it, again, like it, it really brings you to uh, tears because it obviously has that sentimental portion and again has the use of such powerful technology uh, which is again easy for the consumer to use. The AI part is just a video they're consuming and the AR part keeps it engaging for them to consume with the pack. And that's how we got the product also in, in a very subtle way. We are in a very exploratory phase right now where uh, AI has become quite accessible to you know anyone and everyone, right? Um, which can be a very powerful tool. Uh, if you use it well and it can also uh, cause a lot of damage if you don't use it well right as you rightly said um, so in terms of the pros of course i think a lot of it um, for example uh, if i may begin with uh, busy keys imara right uh, i think that's a cool one you guys got the world's first one and um, you know this 
particular, um, if I may call it a chatbot or, you know, however you guys term it, um, is a great way to kind of engage with consumers, right? It's a great way to filter out content uh, from the net. If you're doing some kind of research, uh, there's a broad amount of uh, time you can save because the broad research can be done by this tool and so on and so forth. So in terms of analytics, in terms of culling out raw data, a lot of it time saving, it's efficient, it's cost efficient um, and all of that. And this can be very smartly translated, obviously in the PR and comms world or in the marketing world and so on and so forth. So I think that is definitely a great pro for it. And um, going forward, we already see how that is helping people, even simple things like writing press releases and so on and so forth, right? It's such a quicker job right now. Having said that, um, on the con side of things, we are still not very clear in terms of like we don't have a very defined GDPR like there, there is in Europe. Uh, the data protection is a key, key, key element for us uh, to be you know, aware about. Now, as a large responsible brand, we have to be very, very careful of what data we use, right? It's as simple as when you even take a consumer's phone number, you have to have their permission, right, from a legality standpoint. And we don't want anyone to misuse this content or this kind of information because going to the wrong hands, it can be really badly misused. Um, so I think these are certain filters that we need to put out across and to ensure that we do it in a very ethical way, right? Because ethics, and this is something I feel eventually because you know, um, ethics and empathy is something that really builds equity over time. And uh, we cannot compromise on either in that sense. Um, so yes, there's a lot of pros to it. There's a fair amount of cons to it. And I think with time, everyone is learning in terms of, uh, yes, certain people have already burned their fingers by using it in the wrong way. And certain people have really, enjoyed it and you know bad uh, good fruits of it uh, using it smartly so over time we'll have to sit evolve and uh, kind of use it in a safe manner like we try to use it obviously with partners who are very secure uh, who are very clear about the data sharing um, and how they're going to be using it and we have consent from all the stakeholders and so on and so forth so i think if you have the ethics in the right place and at the end of the day the human should have the final control that is very important and that is something that we should all done for as society at large i would say it's like, you know, when automation had come through before, um, say, Industry 4.0, um, when automation had come through, people thought there would be no more people on factories, there would be no more people on the floors and so on and so forth. But that's not true, because today, those people have gotten skilled better, understand technology better, and they are able to use that in a form to ensure that that particular factory or unit that they're working in delivers more efficiently. So I think the way we need to look at it is, is obviously learning is something that we should never stop. And in the same thing uh, goes through with this as well. It's a great opportunity. We need to learn more and more about it because not every anyone or I would say everyone's not very clear about how exactly it works because there are so many loopholes right now, right? We are evolving this as a technology. So if you look back in the day when uh, cars came, that doesn't mean people don't use other modes of transport, right? People still, we are still very gung-ho in Bangalore, for example, about the Nama Metro, right? It did not mean that people who were bus conductors lost their jobs. It's about how they got skilled better to maybe ride a metro today. If I look at, you know, certain kind of jobs. Uh, so having said that, I think it's, it's, it's the way we look at it. It's the way we train ourselves to get better and um, have that control. And it may be actually leading to even more opportunities than they were before, right? Because, because with the use of AI, you are able to save so much time that you can use your brain in planning more and using the AI to maybe execute certain things in an ethical and controlled manner. Uh, so I think that's how we, we should try and look at it, um, is my opinion, honestly. Uh, but yes, having said that, it, it, it also shows that, you know, it's like survival of the fittest. If you don't, if you don't go um, with the times, then you will stay back, whether you're a person or a brand or a large company. Um, you know, we've seen instances of that of some of the largest firms and operating in some of the uh, like poor monopolies almost uh, are just nowhere there in the business today because they didn't innovate over time. They did not change over time. They did not adapt over time. And um, hopefully that doesn't happen and people kind of use this as an opportunity to learn more and become more productive because it's like human and technology coming together can only because let's say the Romans did not have so much, right? We still have so much development. Today we have the human power. We have the tangibility because see, the, the ethic part of it, the, the emotional angle of it, the understanding of the heart or the people, the empathy, like I said, all of this is something that AI has still not achieved, for instance, right? And that's where the human intervention is very, very important to come to a decision together. You can use all the tools that you want to analyze and everything. Eventually, it's the human who's making the decision. It's he or she sitting in that room, make, taking the final call. And that's when the gut or the natural instinct comes in. And I feel that's how we should try to look at it. Not only one way, but a combination of both together in the best possible manner. I think 
I would just like to maybe look back in my uh, PR uh, role and see that um, you know it's very tough uh, to always. So when it comes to PR or reputation management, uh, you you track like a brand track, right? You track in terms of how the reputation growing. There are multiple parameters: it's DNI, sustainability, profit and loss, people, how you're managing them, and so on and so forth. And large companies, let's say like Retrack and so on, have different ways. Or basically, they have different ways of um, kind of analyzing how your reputation score is at the end of the year or at the end of the financial year and so on, right? Uh, but I think one tool which has always been missing in the PR world, we've always stuck to readership and ABE and you know all of this, um, is a very scientific formula to show ki agar maine ye campaign kiya, so what is my return on investment, right? Because the return, because the investment from a PR campaign is minute, is almost zero compared to how much. Money we spend uh, on a marketing campaign, right? It's very targeted, and in marketing we always know that okay, if I'm spending X, I need to make sure that the ROI is X plus X, X plus Y, whatever, right? Um, but in this case, in PR, I think there's no scientific tool which helps me measure how exactly my reputation campaign, let's say, if you were, um, how did that impact business overall, right? Reputation, yes, is a great parameter, but direct to business, I don't think that it exists right now. So I think that would be one great uh, thing to have from a PR and comms standpoint. Well, um, I think hard work, focus, and perseverance. Uh, these are things uh, that are timeless, and um, these are things that um, I would really urge them to kind of practice. Uh, the beauty is, youngsters today are so well exposed. They have so much technology. Uh, they have so much information. They are so much smarter. They are so much uh, faster at doing things. Um, I think if they just keep their feet on the ground and fly as high as possible, um, the sky is the limit. You know, uh, it's very important to stay humble, uh, regardless of your personal or professional achievements. Uh, and like I said earlier, uh, so now I feel um, you know empathy and ethics um, are two very key things uh, which eventually builds equity over time, and that is very important. And that they will understand over time, as in when they practice whatever that they're doing, uh, because in the long game of things, uh, that'll help you win the bigger picture.